Hidden away high above the University of London is a library that few ever get to see. Its books explore stories so strange they make even the most skeptical at least wonder. They are stories that we can't explain. We can merely present the evidence and leave you to make up your own minds. There is no doubt at all, however, in the minds of the people who claim to have gone through these experiences. They are ordinary people. They come from ordinary places. Their stories are certainly strange. But are they true? Meet Harry Price, psychic investigator. He spent a lifetime collecting all these books in his quest to explain the unexplained. When he died, he left them to the university, where they've continued to baffle the keenest brains around. Tonight, we have two extraordinary stories for you, told through drama reconstruction and interviews with those involved. One is about an Irish family, separated in childhood, and now reunited by a woman who says she's the reincarnation of their mother. But first, the naked eye can see stars hundreds of light years away. The most powerful telescopes can see hundreds of millions of light years away. In all that space, is there even the remotest chance that there are life forms elsewhere in the universe which can reach us? And if there are, why would they choose to descend on one small town more than anywhere else? Todmorden, buried deep between windswept Pennine moorlands, obscure, isolated, and the epicenter of UFO activity in the British Isles. A tenth of sightings are around this town alone. Our story begins with a discovery in a coal yard, which even now, more than ten years on, remains a mystery. He's up there. Alan Godfrey, at the time a constable in the Topmorden police force, was called to the scene. He wasn't there a few hours ago. Lying on top of a pile of coal was a man, dead. He had this terrifying expression. I can only describe it as whatever he'd last saw really terrified him. There was no footprints belonging to him, uh, disturbance on the coal. And so, how did he get up there? You know, I couldn't, I couldn't work out. I could see that on the top of his head, there were individual burn marks. And at the back of the neck, there was a, a rather large weeping type of burn, and there'd been like an ointment smeared on it. The dead man was Zygmunt Adamski, a retired miner, who disappeared five days earlier from a town 20 miles away. The coroner had to record an open verdict. He's still baffled by the questions surrounding the case, like what was the substance on the dead man's neck? We had the substance analysed, and the toxicologists and the scientists couldn't come up with any answers to what it was. And we came up against a blank at every line of investigation. This was one of the most um, puzzling cases that I've come across in 25 years. If somebody proved to me that UFOs exist and that there was one around there at that time, and that in some way we could associate it with this case, then perhaps I might say I'd only raise half an eyebrow. What strengthens the belief in a UFO link is that so many others have also seen things that simply defy explanation. On the moors above Todmorden, next to what's said to be the highest bus stop in Britain, is the Deer Play Inn. One night in 1989, the landlady awoke to see an amazing sight. Well, I never took uh, UFOs seriously at all. So one night, my husband came in to the bedroom and I was asleep. And he came in and said, come on, look at this, pal. And I, I came into the lounge and I saw this light behind that cottage there. It went right across the moor. It, came, it went about 50 miles an hour, came on the car park and lit the car park up like it was daylight. Absolutely, like daylight. I can't believe it. I just don't know. My husband said to me, well, explain that, and I can't explain it. A few miles away, at about 7 o'clock one evening last August, Joanne Elledge, Sarah Wolfenden and Amy Connolly were out with friends. We were just walking up the road, along the road, and uh, one of our friends said, you know, what's that over there, and jumped on the wall. 
so we just got on the wall and had a look and it was just like behind us on the oh, just above the forest and it just seemed to be hovering and watched it for about 10 minutes it was a saucer shape it was oval with red and green lights all around the bottom and it was silent it weren't making any noise at all we couldn't believe that there was some something there that weren't a aeroplane or a helicopter or anything like that we knew it wasn't a normal aircraft or oh anything. Gosh, not really, yeah, really. we just couldn't say anything, just kept watching that. Like grabbing hold of each other, what, what is it? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> but the most extraordinary story must be that of Alan Godfrey, the policeman who made the find on the coal heap. Five months later, he was on duty early one morning when there were reports of cows loose on a council estate. I've been sent to investigate this herd of cows. So I was driving up the road here. I was going to turn right up Fernley Road there to the council estate when I could see in front of me up here this object. It looked to be completely blocking the road. As I get nearer and nearer towards its object, I could see that it wasn't quite what I was expecting to meet at five o'clock or whatever on a, on, a, on a November morning in Tomadin. It was diamond shaped. The bottom half of the object was spinning. It was hovering about five foot off the ground. I could see underneath it. It was about 20 feet wide, 14 feet high. Alpha Bravo 3 to Alpha Bravo Control. Message over. Try HQ. I tried that several times. It just didn't work. I just couldn't uh, contact anybody. So I picked my clipboard up and I started drawing a sketch of it. And then suddenly, I was at the other side of the object and it had gone. It had, uh, it was like another 50, 100 yards of further road driving. What's up? You're not going to believe what I've just seen. Oh, get in. Okay. okay. So we got out of the car like and we examined the, 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 the road yeah, surface, the which was the like was a whirlpool dry. Something really hot had been hovering above there. Uh, we could see the, all these loose leaves and broken branches there. So he was convinced something had been there. We thought it might have gone in this object, wherever it had gone, it might have gone into the adjoining park. We climbed into the park because the gates were locked and we had to climb across the river. Uh, when we got in there, we could see this herd of cows right in the middle of the rugby pitch. they have been raining all night, but there's no hoof prints belonging to them. How have they got there? It just looked as though plop, somebody dropped them there, you know? It sounds incredible, but Alan Godfrey isn't the only one who saw something in the same area on the same night. Another witness was school caretaker Leonard Smith. When I came round the, the corner, to check the grounds. I looked up in the sky and this UFO was up in the sky, approximately over where I later learnt the area where Alan Godfrey had his experience. I didn't know at the time. Now the object shot across the valley four times, backwards and forwards, and it vanished over the hills. Then there's John Porter, one of five other police witnesses that night. An hour before Alan Godfrey's encounter, he was out searching moorland quarries for stolen motorbikes. We were walking down the moor from the main road. Something told me to turn around. I turned, and in the sky was a very cold steel blue light. It moved in a sweeping arc across the sky, about 12 miles, I would estimate, in one second. Eventually, I went up the road and observed this same cold steel blue light sweeping away in a low arc towards Todbedding, and that's the last I saw of it. Despite the support, Alan Godfrey became more and more troubled by the most puzzling part of his experience. After it had all happened, I realised that there was half an hour missing from me drawing the object to me turning up at the other side of where the object had been. I was really curious, you know, what... I wanted to know what had happened in that half hour. 
I persuaded him to undergo regression hypnosis, and two experiments were set up uh, with two uh, doctors who specialized in hypnosis. The video, the uh, hypnotic regression sessions were videotaped, and during them, Alan fills in the missing time, the gaps in his memory. Alan describes getting out of his car, looking at the object, then he sees a, a light emanating from underneath it, so he gets back into his car, finds his car won't go, and then he's engulfed in a bright white light. There's a light. There's he appears to lose consciousness. Uh, he says everything is black. He then wakes up in a room where he sees a tall man. He's also surrounded by six small robots. Who's horrible? Who's horrible? Who's horrible? Who's they? I want to talk about them. He's made the subject of some sort of pseudo-medical examination. In due course, he's put back in his car. But Alan Godfrey himself admits he doesn't know what to make of the hypnosis. After the, my initial sighting, I did read quite a few science fiction books, and it is quite possible that that part of the hypnotic regression uh, is, has got jumbled up in my mind. But I must stress that I did see a UFO that night. Make no mistake about that. I definitely saw what I saw and nobody on this earth will ever tell me any different. So, are the people of Topmonton receiving visits from outer space? The town now has its own observatory with telescopes trained on the skies. We recently had reports of lights moving around in the sky which turned out to be nothing more than a local laser show. Also, we have to be rather cautious because we live under the flight path of two major airports, Heathrow and Manchester. And locally, Manchester um, is a problem in as much as we have lights coming in on incoming aircraft, which give the impression of UFOs in the sky. But most UFO witnesses dismiss the obvious explanations. It was not an aircraft. I got into my van and made radio inquiries regarding this. I still saw the blue light in the sky. I made inquiries with the Army, the RAF, the Civil Aviation Authority, and nothing was in the sky at that time. A less conventional theory is that the geology of the area can produce strange sights. There are many reservoirs and quarries in the Todmorden area, and the local rock has a high concentration of quartz crystals. Scientists have found that this can produce an electrical signal, and on a grand scale, this might turn out to be glowing masses of energy, which can be seen as UFOs. It's also been found that this can affect the human mind and make people see images. I saw what I saw. That object was real. If I'd have got out of the car and thrown a brick at it, it would have gone bang. Strangely enough, even the scientists are now coming round to the view that the people of Todmorden are seeing something. Two friends and I were observing and uh, saw an object which had classic flying saucer shape. Um, we checked to make sure that the telescope we were originally using didn't have optical defects and uh, there was no problem there. Um, much as it's difficult to believe that it was of extraterrestrial origin, to this date, we have no rational scientific explanation for what it was. Before his uh, close encounter, PC Alan Godfrey had been injured on duty. A hospital consultant said he'd be unable to have any more children. After his experience, the effects were reversed, and Alan Godfrey had a son. His joy was out of this world. <laughs> 